Western Christianity has spent the last 2,000 years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is Not Church with John and Nat Turney. This is uh, Nat Turney, your host with the most. Um, <laughs> I, can't, All right. I can't even say that with a straight face, man. <laughs> and this is my brother, John. Who is the other host with a little less? But yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> say hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Oh man, it's kidding. All right, we are joined today by two amazing people, and uh, I just I'm just going to take a second and introduce them. We have two fantastic guests on the show. Uh, the first person that we want to introduce you to is Felicia Merle. That's Merle like Pearl, right? Because she is a gem, and we love her. Um, she's a student in the Living School at the Center for Action and Contemplation. If you don't know what that is, that's Richard Rohr's amazing, not even a cohort of awesome people. Um, certified master life coach, a former ordained pastor with over 20 years of church leadership experience. She also serves on the teaching team for Vinings Lake Church and in the publishing industry as a freelance copy editor. Felicia is the author of Truth Encounters, which is available on Amazon, and she resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico with her husband, Doug. Together, they have four adult children, and you can connect with Felicia on Instagram at, at hello Felicia underscore Merle, or follow her on Facebook. So she's everywhere. Welcome to the podcast, Felicia. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, we're, we're so honored that you're here. And actually, we sort of became aware of you through our other guest that we have on today, and our other guest is Mercy Aiken. Uh, Mercy has... Uh, uh, lived both in Palestine and intermittently in, in Bethlehem from September 2015 to the summer of 2020. Prior to this, she worked many years as a writer and leader in various web-based ministries and leadership in local churches. She's involved with Bethlehem Bible College and the Biannual Christ at the Checkpoint Conference held in Bethlehem, which challenges evangelicals to consider the perspective and experience of Palestinian Christians. She's also committed to relationship and bridge-building work with Muslims and Jews, she is currently pursuing a master's degree through St. Stephen's University. Woo, woo, shout out to St. Stephen's. And is the author of a soon-to-be-released book about Dr. Uh, I'm going to say it, Bashara Awad. Perfect. Uh, oh, like. Look at that. The founder of <laughs> Bethlehem Bible College, tentatively entitled Fire in Bethlehem. Uh, welcome to the program, Mercy. Thank you. Great to be here. Oh, so good, man. There's so much good stuff going on. You're about the third or fourth person so far I've seen that's in, involved with St. Stephen's. Makes you want to get back into school. So uh, that's amazing. You know, I put this whole thing back to Brad Jersak because I think he's the one that connected Felicia and I. So, Oh, really? Oh, you know what? <laughs> Ever since I started following you on Facebook, Felicia, I see Brad just... Man, he's all over your posts all the time. He loves yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, and anyone yeah, who Brad yeah. loves must be an amazing human because Brad is also amazing. So um, bravo to him for having good taste and people to follow on Facebook, <laughs> although he never <laughs> likes my stuff. So whatever. Uh, so. <laughs> if, if it's all if it's all the same let's go ahead and jump right in felicia i'm really i'm excited to talk to you you and i had a really lovely conversation i guess it's been about a month or so ago now and i first reached out to see if you'd be on the podcast and we had a nice phone call and i just felt like we hit it off and we had a lot in common weirdly enough that you had ties to humboldt county where, uh, oh, really? where john and i are both from yeah did you not know that john no yeah i was so just like Floyd when you said you guys were from Humboldt County, but so we've been through that area a couple of times and driven all around there, spent the night there, um, you know, just visited and everything. So small world. Yeah, definitely. It is a small world. It's so cool. I, uh, I immediately, after I talked to you, I went on Amazon and I bought your book because that's what you do. And you told me something that stuck with me. And I want you to expand on this a little bit before we talk about your book. But I said, I'm going to go buy your book. And you said, um, you said to me, oh, there's a reason that Jesus wrote in sand. <laughs> and I just, man, I chuckled. And then I went, oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's deep. But we didn't really delve further. So what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I just think that as we all grow, I'll actually have to credit the, the thought to Paul, something Paul Young told, um, said years ago. And Paul said that, like, as we journey, we move from base camp to A to B to C to D. And when we move along, we get to B and we think everyone in A is stupid because they're still believing what they believe. And the right. people in C, are weird, we don't believe what they believe. And the people in D are definitely heretics or, you know, demonic possessed and going to hell. 
And so <laughs> you know, the thing is of where people are based on where we are in our journeys. And, but then when we reach C, we realize that, or when we reach C, we realize that, oh, okay, these people aren't necessarily where they were just journeying a little bit further ahead than I was. And then at some point in your life, hopefully you also get grace for the people that are still at B or A or wherever like that. And so I just think that we have to allow for the places and really honor our our whole journey, the entirety of it, instead of feeling like we have to cut it off. Um, But, you know, there are certainly things that I believed in my past um, that I no longer believe that's reflected in the book in some places. And so you know, I understand why things were written in sand because they could be erased and there's not like a record <laughs> of it. But I remember Steve McVeigh in that, like one thing that I love is that for, for truth encounters, for where I was at that time, that book is very, very real and true and, and honest. And I also realized that there are people who are journeying who need that as a marker, who need to be able to go to those words to encounter Father Jesus and Holy Spirit in that way. And, you know, they all have a process. And if I can be somewhat of a guide or, you know, a marker along the way, then I'm, I'm very humbled to be able to do that. But, um, yeah, so there's there are some places in the book, though, that I kind of wish I could edge through a little bit. But it is. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 having, having read through it, and uh, first of all, it's remarkable. It's still, I mean... It's a, it's it's not an easy read. The first couple chapters of that book are hard, and I was telling my wife I was actually reading some of this to her, and we were just sort of sitting, and I was just excited about it, and I was telling her as you're going through your opening story, I kept waiting for the happy ending. And I'm like, well, this is clearly this is going to resolve in a, in this way, and it it never does because you're honest and you're telling your truth, and it was hard to read. You know, but there was so much beauty in the rawness of it. There was so much beauty in the in the transformative power of truth, even if it's not pretty. I don't want to give too much of it away because I want people to buy it and read it. But um, it was it, it's remarkable in its honesty. But I could tell there were places where even just having the short conversation that you and I had, I'm like, I bet there's some that might be one of those things she talked about. Like there's some, you know what I mean? Like, like, OK, I, if that triggers me a tiny bit, I bet it triggers her a little bit. But it hundred percent reflective of where you were when you wrote it, and I, I just, I just think it's great. Um, I wanted to ask you about the role of, and I've asked this of a few guests now because it seems to be a recurring theme. But the role of shame, especially in the life of a Christian, which sounds so weird to say when you put it like that, and you, when you juxtapose shame and the gospel, but you, the more conversations that I have with people, this theme of shame comes up all the time. And there was something you wrote in this book I wanted to get your feedback on. And then we're going to jump into uh, bringing mercy in here, too. But you wrote this in the, the chapter about your mother. And this is powerful, I thought. So the lies we agree with when someone wrongs us leads us to perform or live out of those painful experiences. It creates a false reality. In order to completely let go or let my mom off the hook, I had to evaluate the experience with Holy Spirit, count the cost, sum it all up then choose to forgive her and hand the pain of the experience to Jesus. But that whole thing of the, of us agreeing with the lies and that false reality that's created. So Paul Young, right? Because that's, that's what I think hundred percent the shack introduced us to this thing of this falseness that we live in. But um, I just kind of wanted to get your, get you to maybe expand on that a little bit. What kinds of lies had, had that, had that caused you to agree with, if that makes sense? Um, it does. I, you know, I see this so much with just in day to day life where things go bad, um, bad things happen, and we don't, we haven't been taught how to sit with mystery, right? So, what we need to do is to rush to um, create an explanation or a reason for why things happen. And sometimes, when we're not even able to do that, what we do is we take on the things that happen as our identity, which is really what shame is. I mean, shame is just not that something bad happened, but that I am bad, right? And so we start internalizing those things. And then um, we create a false reality or narrative that keeps people at bay, that keeps a distance. Because if I think I am bad, um, if I have all of these misperceptions and ideas about myself, 
then I, because people are mirrors, I assume that when you look at me, this is what you see. And the last thing I want is, you know, for you to see that. And so I either have to perform and put on another mask to cover what I think is the real me, um, or I project and I make you, you know, the boogeyman because I myself feel like the boogeyman. So you have, have all this dance going on. And I think what, you know, um, going through truth encounters, I think what happened in my relationship with my mom, that's probably has been my hardest relationship. And my dad died actually in, in two days, it'll be four years. But, um, I've written very honestly that, you know, my dad was kind of the bridge between my mom and I, and, um, he helped maintain peace as years got older. And I had a really hard time just being in relationship, um, with her as a person because of things that happened in our childhood, things that are perceived. Even as I moved through my own walk with Christianity, um, I felt like, you know, she was really hyper religious. I just didn't want to be anything like her, which honestly, I am so much like my mom. <laughs> that was very, very hard right. to to admit. But with my dad out of the way, um, what ended up happening is I had to one sit with the reality that I created inside of our relationship, and I had to sit with you know spirit to see what was true about that and what was not. What was judgment? What was me keeping her at bay? And then what was me not having unconditional acceptance for her? And so so there's a lot to that in my own self. My deepest desire is to have freedom. I think that's the, that's the same when you get into issues of race, when you get into even, you know, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that's going on right now. The deepest desire of every human being is to have freedom, to be able to live fully alive in their inherent dignity and worth and to be seen, to be heard, to be valued. And that ultimately is to be free. Right. And so I never felt like I had that freedom. And in some aspects, I still don't. Right. But what I have learned is that I can extend freedom without having to demand someone give me that. And so that's a dance that, that we're still working working through inside of all of that. But I don't, I don't know. It's, it's been a journey, but that's kind of how I moved from that false reality into um, how we're doing relationship now. And it's just, she is who she is. She's not going to change. Unfortunately, you know, she'll be 70 in July. And, and so I can either choose not to be in relationship with her, or I can see that she still has wounded places and show up because I desire to love her, right? And so, so that's where we are in that in the that story. But the happy ending is just that I learned to love, I learned to forgive, and I learned that um, truth was my way to move from shame into freedom. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. That's a, it, one of those things that have you know I'm almost fifty, and uh, John is over fifty. <laughs> <laughs> your old dude. Um, but uh, in my almost 50 years of life, I've finally, I've finally at a place where I understand that not everything resolves. Like, like we don't get neat, tidy bows on things. And one of the hardest things that when you spoke about your relationship with your mother, both in the book and just now, I, I, um, I, I my wife's relationship with her mother was, was difficult as well. And, uh, we only ever resolved it and we didn't resolve it, but the resolution had to be love her regardless. And then we were, you know, as you, as you talked about with your own mother, when you begin to see them as human beings who've been wounded and who've been failed and who've been, you know, have their own disappointments and things and that, 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 that they've dealt with, it makes a lot of this a little, makes it a little easier to see that they're doing the best they can sometimes. So I don't know if that has any parallel whatsoever, but with mercy, um, how do, <laughs> I'm gonna that's a that's the world's worst segue. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is there any is, is there any parallel though between you know I I I don't know I don't want to oversimplify the Palestinian Israeli struggle. Um, it's centuries old. It's mired in all kinds of issues of the past. But um, do you see any parallel there between you know just allowing like each side allowing the other side to be who they are and not and not trying to force people into 
preconceived notions of of what they should be. I don't know. And, and am I oversimplifying that, or or is it, is it way more complex? Um, it's way more complex, I think. <laughs> okay. but, yeah. I will, but I will say, you know, at the heart of it, you know, one of the like, if we want to go into more of a contemplative philosophical posture, you know, and then take it out from that place, like at the heart of it, God made. God made us to be together and he made humanity to be like complementary, like different complementary, beautiful, a mosaic, you know? And so, yeah, like there's definitely lost in the Palestinian Israeli conflict. There's definitely lost the sight of the humanity of the others for sure. You know, absolutely 100%. It's born out of a lot of complexities. I mean, you could talk about on the Jewish side, the various complexities that have uh, created a situation where they don't see the humanity in the Palestinians and in the Arab people. And there's there's layers of reasons for that, mm. some of which have nothing to do with the Arab people at all, but which have to do more with white Christian Europe and the anti-Semitism that they experienced there. Uh, which trauma collectively traumatized a people for 2000 years living in diaspora so that when they come into their land, they, many of them still have this feeling like everyone hates us and everyone is against us. And right. then you begin to create a new state like on land where people are already living, where they are wanting to have their own self-determination and their own state. And so war and conflict inevitably breaks out. And for, I think, a lot of Jewish people, they interpreted that through the lens of the anti-Semitism of Christian Europe and projected that onto the Arabs. So a lot of Palestinians will say, like, we're paying the price for the sins that you guys uh, committed in Europe, in a way. Like, we're the ones who've had to lose and lose and lose and lose and and have had to bear the brunt of that. Yeah. So, um, you know, that would be the dehumanization that the Arab and and the dehumanization of the Arab people is something that I find shocking now that now that I'm kind of aware of it, like the dehumanization of the way that white people in the West, Christians, just generally, like they will speak about Arabs or Muslims or depict them in such dehumanizing ways in um, television or in any type of media, you know, like they are, they're all violent, they're backwards, they're illogical, they're just passionate people moving by the whims of the moment and, and you can't deal reasonably with them and... They're wild ass people, uh, mm. which is what I heard one Christian say to me when I first came to Israel. They are Ishmael. They are all wild asses. Wow. And I was like, my goodness, you know, would you? And I just started thinking about how, you know, the book of Genesis, like these typologies in the book of Genesis, which was written, you know, a very long time ago and, and, and with typologies, not necessarily describing like the functions of how people are going to be living thousands of years in the future and like imposing all sorts of structures on different ethnicities based on uh, the book of Genesis. Like it was used to justify slavery, for example. Shed, of course, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, yeah. And so I see the same thing happening with the Arab and Jewish people also, like the same sort of racist tropes uh, used to justify certain things being pushed on a people that this has nothing to do with what, you know, the writer of Genesis was intending at all. Like if you would have known thousands of years later that people were using these things to justify all sorts of... So anyway, that's kind of a rambling answer for... On the Arab side, there is... There is um, I do see dehumanization of Jews at times, but more of it, and Israelis in particular, more of that is born out of like the frustration or the a reactionary feeling against what we have been subjected to for the past like 75 years, for the past 100 years since the Jewish nationalist movement began in their homeland. So, and what they're still going through today, it's not just ancient past, it's yesterday. It's right, right. now. It's tomorrow. And that's the thing that makes it so... But I, I do think most Arabs that I've talked to, Palestinian Arabs, they try to differentiate when they talk between Jews and Israelis. 
nevertheless, sometimes some of that language to me is very uncomfortable because I've spoken enough with some of my Jewish friends and I know certain sorts of analogies and things that are I've learned more about what anti-Semitism is and how how it feels to be a Jewish person on the receiving end of it when certain tropes are said. So they control the media or this is why this is happening because of all the power that they have with the banks, with money and the media and that sort of thing. And some Palestinians um, kind of more innocently say those types of things, not necessarily intending to be anti-Semitic because they lived with Jewish people. You know, for years in the Middle East, Jews and Arabs and Muslims lived together side by side, Middle Eastern Jews. And so, you know, it's it's very complex. I find it interesting that uh, you, you bring up the media because, I mean, specifically American media, uh, American television, period, right? You know, I'm, I'm, like Nat said, over 50. So I have some definite ideas of what, I, I was taught about certain groups of people by watching TV. Yeah. All television shows say that Muslims are terrorists. Uh, they're plotting to destroy this country. All African Americans in this country are thugs. Um, they are here to rob me and take my money and to murder my children and to run some kind of drug lord connection, right? Or on the other side of that, they are they are the comedic relief for us white people to watch their television shows and get a moment of like, see, we are kind of the same because they, they like comedy. We like mm-hmm. comedy. And so you get into this, you get into this situation where there's this othering of, of everybody that isn't like you. And the media seems to just kind of hand us this on a silver platter that um, we can't get along with anybody because we are so different um, like I said, the Arabs are going to be the terrorists. The African Americans are going to be the thugs. The Jewish people are going to be the ones trying to take our money and control our media. How do we? And I can throw this out to either one of you. How? Uh, where do we even start to tear that down and to get to the bottom of this, where we can see each other first? Like we we're trying to say, is as, as human beings, and that there is. There's so much more to our our lives than what the media and what the white Christian evangelical church has told us about all these other people. Right. I think the first thing, though, is awareness, because I, I don't think we really stop to consider how the media has normalized that. And what was really interesting is even even in um, like listening to what Mercy was sharing about the Palestinians about them, Ishmael and the wild ass, the same lines have been used against black people for years with um, Ham, you know, and Crispy Canaan and, and that. So you have that same kind of thing that's been played out, right? But when you list all the different ethnicities, the one that's never listed is white, right? So white is how we normalize life instead of, um, I remember Otis Moss, the third, someone asked him a, a very similar question to what you just asked. And his response was for white people to stop being white. And, you know, the person kind of sat back and didn't understand it. But he went on to explain that before white people were white, they were Polish, they were Hungarian, they were Irish, they were, you know, they were Italian. They they were the ethnicity. And when there was, you know, it only became to the advantage of really greed and power um, for it to to move from these distinct ethnicities to this broad whitewashing, if you will, because then, you know, there was a sense of hierarchy that was created inside of that. And so, but when there is again that real sense of honor and place for the ethnicities, then it also may open an awareness for all ethnicities, you know? And so, but we have to first become aware that we have normalized every other ethnicity against whiteness. Like that's, that's the standard, you know? And, and then, and it takes us getting to the place where, like I said earlier, I really, really believe that our unwillingness to be, um, just uncomfortable to sit with discomfort has caused apathy. And because we're not willing to feel that discomfort, we won't go to these places. 
I, yeah, that's amazing. Um, stop being white. I'm down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's strange when you think about it because, because white, white isn't, white isn't a race. It, it is, you know what I mean? It's a, it's so, um, I remember back in the, back in the day, you know, people getting upset because, um, you know, I've, I've lived long enough to see, um, the appropriate moniker for African-Americans change. Right. Um, and so people, you know, people like me, like, well, we used to call you this and you don't like that anymore. We used to call you this. You don't like that anymore. And now we're African-Americans and they got mad because, well, we don't go around calling ourselves Polish Americans. And, but I'm like, actually, yeah, yeah, you do all the time. I see it all the time. My, my, my father's extremely proud of his Irish heritage, as am I. You know, I have friends who are Italian Americans who are extremely proud of, they belong to clubs that celebrate their Italian heritage. And I would, man, I'm, I'm, I love all of that. Yeah, um, absolutely. But this sort of yeah. like you, you, that, that term you used, whitewashing, of, of does the same thing though, in my opinion, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, but it does the same thing to black culture where, you know, there are a large variety of ethnicities represented, people who are from the Caribbean, people who are from certain parts of Africa, whatever. And when we, when we label each other as all one homogenous thing, we isolate everyone to one homogenous experience that can't possibly be true. You know, somebody's experience as if they come over, you know, if they, if they end up in America from Jamaica or Haiti or the Caribbean someplace else, won't be the same experience as somebody who's third or fourth generation or fifth generation or who can trace their ancestry back to a plantation. That experience won't be the same. Um, and I think we do a disservice to each other when we don't allow for those differences and those, and actually not just allow for them, but to celebrate them and embrace them. I don't know. That's, that's just one, one white guy's opinion. I hope I'm not too far <laughs> off base there. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I'm just thinking while you're talking that nothing, I mean, yeah, these constructs of like white, black, Arab, Jew, they're all so shallow and they're so in some ways uh, very unhelpful. I mean, in some ways, and now I would say not, not as a white person, I don't identify with white. Like I do identify with being Irish and uh, English and Scottish. And I'm actually a little bit Jewish myself as Basque, you know, all the different things that I am. And, and the same is with the Palestinians and the Israelis. Like one of the things that strikes me when I'm over there is what a melting pot both of these people are, you know? Like you see, you see white people, you see black people, you see dark skinned people, you see all different types of ethnicities on both sides of the wall. And you also see all different types of mindsets, you know, like it's just there, there are Israelis who are working for peace hand in hand with Palestinians. There are Palestinians who are doing the same with Israelis. It's not about like Jews and Muslims, you know, this very, very overly simplistic way that we hear it in the media. But there, there is like the place of like the, the structure of like whiteness and power and privilege that we, you know, experience that I experienced as a white American. So yeah, my advice on how to, how to fix that, like to my fellow white people, you know, first recognize that, you know, first of all, that it is more complex when you're looking out at other groups of people, like there's, there's all kinds of layers of, of humanity there. But but we need to start with a place of like much greater humility. I mean, I guess I would say that's what that's what began my journey is like, you know, I, I guess I would just say like for me, spending time in the gospel and like what what the Lord, you know, has done in Christ, like in Christ, he's brought us all back together. There is neither Jew nor Greek and male nor female and all of these other things that that uh, have become so divisionary on planet Earth, like from the beginning, the things that were meant to be like complementary and beautiful have become sources of war and division. And so like knowing that, and as we pray for like the unity of the church, and as we pray for the beauty of Jesus Christ to be like revealed in this body that is composed of all of these different parts and different glorious, beautiful, different, you know, pieces that don't all look the same. It just compels me to, I want to hear the voices of my, my brothers and sisters who are coming from a different perspective and who are living in a different situation and who are, you know, I remember when I first went to Palestine, I was talking with my pastor and 
and and, and it, I don't know how it occurred to me because I was really living in a in a bubble of white privilege in many many ways, but it occurred to me, you know, I don't know what it is to experience Christianity from the place of the underside of power. And I've admired like looking at the black church and the way that they process their Christianity, the, the sort of the songs that they sing, the way that they look at the world. Like I knew that 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 was Christianity that was formed from a different place than my Christianity, which was formed from a place of much greater ease and privilege, sort of like sitting on this, this high mountain peak, not of, not of, um, revelation or anything, but just on like a high mountain peak of privilege in a way, like looking down and seeing the way that other Christians process their faith and sort of having the assumption my whole life, like the way we do it up here is the right way. And these other people are like working their way towards, towards the sort of peace and stability and everything that we already have. And we can like help them along the way. But this is, this is sort of the ideal that we're going towards, like what I have right now, like this sort of unconscious assumption, you know, that we sort of have growing up. And somewhere along the way, for me, what, what changed was the summer of 2014. Um, when it was like these twin conversions of two two issues that had to do with race and ethnicity. It was what was happening in Ferguson. And interestingly enough, it was also the bombing uh, in Gaza, a previous bombing in Gaza, like what we're going through right now. And I found during that summer that that when I posted simple things on Facebook, like I am weeping with the families of those who are weeping in Ferguson right now. And I extend my condolences, just something very simple like that. Or I uh, am praying for the people in Gaza I'm, and the people in Israel, but also the people in Gaza. <laughs> and the kind of the, sh- the type of pushback that I got from my fellow white Christians shocked me, frankly, like it floored me because I thought we were all talking about the same thing when we were talking about the unity of the body of Christ and revival and the church needs to come together more and we need to break down these boundaries and walls, things that we prayed about, things that we sang about, things that we just had such passion about. And yet when we have an opportunity to to sort of empathize and at least try to understand what the other group is going through, like being met with such fierce uh, antagonism that I thought there is something deeper. There is something much bigger here. I felt in a way like I had walked up to a sleeping dragon or what looked to be a sleeping dragon. And I had just lightly tapped it, you know, and, and just to see what it was. And the thing raised its head and went right in my face. (laughs) That was feeling. And it made me, that was what woke me up more than anything, that startling image that came in my spirit that I saw, which is that race, racial issues, the issue of white supremacy is way deeper. Like this is something like where the dragon lurks down at the roots of the ancient mountains. This is where this thing is embedded. And I was naive. I honestly thought everything was much better than it was. And that, you know, that, that, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know until I had that wake up call. And now I see it everywhere. And I used to think, oh, it's sweet when people talk about getting over racism, because that's how it used to be in the past. People used to be racist. You know, I mean, I was just naive. I didn't know. And so, um, so that's just kind of my word out to my fellow white Christians, especially like there are things that we just don't know. Like we think we know, we think we understand it. We need to have much more humility. We need to, we need to humble ourselves and just, we need to, if we can just assume that I have a big blind spot that has been born of this this cultural privilege and bubble that I've grown up in. It's not my fault. I didn't choose it. I grew up in it. I'm not, you know, attacking anybody or myself. Like we are who we are. This is the context that we have, but this is the context that we have to work through. This is what is given to us as white North American Christians. Other people have their thing given to them from God. This is our, we have to humble ourselves. We have to listen. We have to stop being so defensive. We have to stop 
playing the martyr role whenever anyone right yeah. Yeah. tries to bring these other things up or feel like everything that we have is being threatened. We need to just stop being so defensive. Lower the defenses. The people that were the people that are crying out for help, they're the ones who have actually really been suffering and way more than we've ever even realized. Like we need to hear what they're saying. Like they're the ones who are actually being persecuted, you know, the ones who are suffering under oppression, not us. Yeah. As we, as we sit over here and, you know, lament our culture wars and get pissed off because Starbucks didn't put the name Jesus on their latest Christmas cup. um, There's actual persecution happening. I wanted to say this before I forget Felicia, um, as I've studied and I have tried to uh, widen my, my perspectives and I've, I've read some, some good books and I've, uh, the African American experience in the church to me makes you some of some of the most brave people that I know because I would have given up on Christians a long time ago. Yeah, I mean the fact that there are African American Christians in the world tells me that the gospel can actually transform and help to heal and forgive. Because this, I, I just don't think I'd have walked away from the whole damn thing. Well, I think when you, when you go back to the history of Africa, though, you realize that Christianity actually existed there long before we had the oh, yeah. slave masters version of it here. You know, and so and that's the thing that we don't we're not told right because we have been so this elitist version of Christianity. Even when when Mercy was talking about the scripture about there's neither Jew nor Greek or whatever. One of the things that I've had to learn inside of this is that a lot of times people's picture, their interpretation of that scripture doesn't match other people's interpretation of that scripture. And for some people, particularly those that have bought into American and Americanized Christianity, that scripture, um, unity for them means erasure, right? Because the whole idea of America is the big melting pot. And inside of the melting pot, you lose your identity, you lose your particularity, you lose all of those things, which really, when you look at the model of the Trinity and Father Jesus and Holy Spirit, we're, we've been shown a picture, a model for how to make space for particularity. Because here you have ultimate oneness, ultimate unity inside this picture of the Trinity, but you still see the particularity and the specifics of, of Father Jesus and Holy Spirit never, you know, blurring or losing their distinction. But the way that we read that scripture most often, we use it really as gaslighting. We use it to give ourselves a pass, to to just say, you know, why do you want to be black? Why do you need to be Palestinian? Why do you need to be this? Why do you need to be Arab? Why do you need to be whatever? Why can't you just be? And so we want to erase the things that are particular to us. And I don't really think that that is was being asked of us. I, for one, I never want to not be black. And I realized that black is a social construct that was handed to me. I understand that the whole language and the ideas of races and terms was created, but we are here now. And so now that we are here, how do we live together in this? And I, you know, so I think we have to address the ways, um, even our learning has been co-opted and a lot of the things that we have been told are true, there may be some truth to them, but there's also layers to that truth. There's other parts to that truth. Um, there's other voices that have a perspective on that truth that have not been permitted to share that, you know, even as um, Mercy brought up the thing for her that was kind of this moment of Ferguson and Gaza. And and a book for me that really um, opened my heart in, in a very, very deep way was Angela Davis, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. But in this book, Angela Davis, Professor Angela Davis tells the story of when the event happened in Ferguson and all the protests went on to the point that they brought in the tank, the National Guard and the tanks. The tanks that they brought in were Israeli tanks. And when they were firing on the black protesters in Ferguson, from Mike Brown's death being left out there for hours and hours and hours. When they, when they did that, it was Palestinian freedom fighters who were tweeting to black protesters in Ferguson to tell them what to do because this was their reality over in Gaza that they faced. And so when you look at this, 
you know, when you're in America, you think black, white, that the issue is black, white. But the issue of racism, this issue of supremacy, this issue of hierarchy and dehumanization is a global thing. This is a global thing. And, just, you know, this same issue of the Palestinian Israeli conflict, it mirrors the South African apartheid issue that went on. It mirrors, it mirrors Jim Crow South, you know. And so I, I think at some point we have to stop and realize that maybe we haven't had all the parts of the truth. And if we're willing to read books other than what we've been reading, listen to histories other than what we've known, I was so shocked to learn about the Coptic Christianity and to learn about the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and how long they've been there. You know, oh, yeah. all of that, just so much history that would help broaden our narrow views in, in big ways, I think. Yeah, it was Brad Jersak who, who who made me aware of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church yeah. primarily. Yeah. And uh, uh, it seems like Brad comes up in every conversation, but that's <laughs> fine. Um, but... I, it came up at one point because I found out that the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible contains many more books than yeah. mine does. And I was a little jealous. I'm like, why do y'all get more books, man? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'll, I'll pick up a copy. It's like 88 something. I think it's 88 books in the Ethiopian Orthodox. Wow. But don't they trace their lineage back to um, the woman at the well? Isn't that the storyline that, that she goes and, and evangelized? Was it the Syrophoenician woman or, or, or am, I com, am I conflating stories? But um, regardless, there was somebody. Oh, well, no, no, I'm sorry. There was an the Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, my bad. Um, I am conflating stories because I do that sometimes. Sometimes I just make stuff up. But, Don't um, y'all. <laughs> but regardless, that, that <laughs> the fact that there was. so the, And see, that's Felicia, you brought that up. And it's so, so interesting that the story as a kid that I was told was that Christianity was introduced to the savage people, you know, that we, you know, and there, and there was this, there was all this weird justification for yeah. like, Oh yeah, yeah. Slavery was bad, but thank God, you know, we got them all saved, you know, and, and, and th that you bring up the fact that no, that's actually bullshit. There was Christianity on the continent way before there probably was in North America. And, and if anything, it's a return to a more, um, I don't even know what the word, but just to a more original version of that. I, I've always loved my experiences going to black churches. I've always loved the people that I, that I have known throughout my life. And, but I still say that because of the way that Christianity was foisted upon a people and then used as justification to treat them as subhuman, I still think you're brave as hell for sticking around. Yeah. I still think I might've been like, you know I what, screw this it. whole thing. Let's go do something else. Yeah. But, but you are here and we're better and we're better for it. So, you know, thank you for sticking it out. <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, Let's talk about Richard Rohr for a second, because I love I love your connection with Richard. I've always loved um, I've always been drawn to the Franciscan way of contempl you know, contemplation. And so what is uh, what's your connection with Richard? I know you had a, an article recently published, didn't you, in the by the center? I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I, I'm a student in the um, living school, which is their two year program. Um, which is basically a contemplative school. You do a lot of history on the Christian mystics and um, that specific tradition. Um, I found Richard in 2013, I believe. I just really started um, kind of moving away from some of the things that I believed I was largely Pentecostal charismatic and um, had reached a place where Holy Spirit had asked me to hand over everything that I believed to be true about God and that basically spirit would hand back to me what was true. And so I was in a process of doing that. And wow. somehow, um, oh, I know through um, the work of the people, which is a website that Travis Reed um, operates. It's like a liturgy and they have some teachings and things. I ran into video by Richard Rohr and then started reading his work very, very happily and a couple of years ago, my husband was employed at Habitat for Humanity International as their director of faith engagement, saw a job opportunity here in Albuquerque at the center and decided to apply for it. And lo and behold, he got it. So a couple of years ago, we moved to Albuquerque. Wow. So my husband is actually employed at the center. And then I just decided since we were here and our lives were different, 
that I would take this opportunity to um, apply to the living school and go through the school. So I was accepted last year in the cohort and I've been going through the first year of that program. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, I, man, I just love Richard Rohr. I, I, I don't, I think anyone who ever becomes aware of him instantly likes him and says, okay, that's a, that's a guy uh, I could, I could learn from. One of these days, I'd love to have a chat with him. He's a, he's a really great person, very humble, very, you know, who he is. So we had an opportunity to, pre COVID to attend some of the masses he did here, which was neat and interesting being a Protestant Christian to go yeah. into a Catholic church for the first time when you've been through right. there, you know, you're going to, yeah, they're all going to hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've often told people uh, it's because of guys like like Richard that I could I could be Catholic I could be that kind of Catholic for sure um, I could be a contemplative Franciscan for sure um, but then again um, we are who we are so so the article that was published was just what, last month wasn't it Yes, I've had an occasion to um, have a couple of things published in their warning journal so the most recent one was awesome. uh, the trauma issue and I had a poem in that one so. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it was so it was so cool to see that connection. Uh, I wasn't aware of it when we first started talking. I was like, "Oh, Albuquerque. Yeah, I should have made that connection." But yeah, um, that's the only reason black people would move to Albuquerque. There's like three point seven percent. Yeah. So, like otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, what's the point, right? I've been to Albuquerque. No disrespect, but come on, man. <laughs> Albuquerque is a cool city. <laughs> it is the only bright spot in that entire state. So, if you're from New Mexico, I'm sorry, but I got no use for most of your state. It's, uh, <laughs> oh, I spent too much time. I spent too much time in Western New Mexico and Carlsbad and Roswell and. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's just too much like West Texas to me. But that that's that's just an aside. Um, so, Mercy, you you have a project you're working on. I'm curious to see to hear what you're talking about with this uh, the book the, that you mentioned in our in your bio. Hmm. Oh, I'm so excited about this story. It's just um, an incredible story of Bashar Awad. He's the man who founded uh, Bethlehem Bible College, which is the only Protestant non-denominational college on the West Bank for Christians was actually um, the first one, the first Christian college on the West Bank at all for Christians, which they started in 1979. And when I started really getting drawn into the issue with Palestine, I found Bethlehem Bible College on the internet and I went over there and started volunteering with the college. And um, as I got to know Bashara, I just was Imp- just totally blown away by the power and the uh, the tragic story, but that was so filled with hope and so filled with grace of this Palestinian Christian family. That's like an ancient Christian family from New uh, from Jerusalem, where he grew up. And in 1948, when he was a little boy, when the war was going on over Jerusalem and the the um, what the Palestinians call the Nakba or the catastrophe, what Israelis call Israeli independence and the birth of the state in um, 1948, May of 1948, their family was in this little house that was caught in the crossfire, this little Palestinian Christian neighborhood right outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And they were stuck in there without food. Like they couldn't get out. They couldn't go anywhere because the Jordanian army was on one side and the Zionist uh, army was on the other side. And his dad went out one morning, um, it seemed a little quiet, and he thought he'd go out and look for some food for the family. And he was immediately shot by a sniper that was coming from the uh, Israeli side, like, bam. So the story then just goes on from there, how his family had to escape from their home a few days later as the uh, Zionist army came in and took that neighborhood and put it under the Israeli side. And like 750,000 other Palestinians, they lost their home and and they left with their key and they weren't uh, able to return. So his family became refugees on the east, what became the east side of Jerusalem, right on the seam line. And he and all his siblings had to grow up in orphanages because the mother couldn't, there was, there was no, nothing. I mean, it was impossible to care for them. There were so many orphans. There was no food. There was no work. There was nowhere to live. It was just complete chaos. But they had this really strong faith in the Lord. And I look at Bashar's mother, whose name was Huda Awad, as like, she should be canonized in some, (laughs) you know, 
some system somewhere because this woman was of such incredible faith and of such incredible grace. And when the children would ask her, like, who killed our dad? And she would say, we don't know. It was probably the Jews. And she'd say, we don't know for sure who did it because there have been bullets flying from both sides. And regardless, I don't want you to have hatred or enmity or unforgiveness towards anybody. So we just forgive whoever it was. There's nothing we can do about it. He's gone. We have to look towards the future and trust the Lord to help us and and do something. I don't know. She just had this incredible sense of love and, and just saintliness and grace. So anyway, I really believe it was probably because of her prayers and faithfulness that her children just grew up to do mighty great things. They've been such uh, pillars of stability and grace and mercy and truth in the Holy Land, especially in their Palestinian Christian community. So Bashara went on to start Bethlehem Bible College against all odds, against every kind of um, difficulty that you can imagine within his own community as like Protestants, like kind of being thought of suspiciously by the old guard, like the old Catholics and the Orthodox. Um, within the context of being a Christian minority, within a Muslim majority, within the context of living under Israeli occupation. So um, what the Palestinian Christians are going through, like their story is so forgotten, overlooked. People are not even aware that there are Palestinian Christians. And there is such a, there is such a power of God in that community that I see like in the finest places of like the black community or any other America in America or any other place where there are communities that are living under like in this minority status in a powerless way under a boot heel. And yet they develop their faith. It, it just, it just sparkles and shines um, in, in such a powerful way. So yeah, it, for me, it was just a tremendous privilege when Bashar asked me if I would write his story. I had never written a book before, so it was, but I'd always wanted to, and I always felt that I would, and I should, and I probably have many more books that I need to write. But this was my first one. I thought, okay, I'm going to do this if you trust me to do this, Bashara. So um, the book is right now in the pipeline to be looked at at uh, Baker Books. Um, okay. And I'm just fingers crossed. Um, otherwise I'm going to submit it to IVP. Um, but it should be coming out hopefully like within a year or so, like it's, it's moving and, um, it's going to be a book that I hope will really inspire people and also open their minds and their hearts to, 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 to the, first of all, as Christians, to their Palestinian Christian brothers and sisters, like just as Christian to Christian within the body of Christ, just to bring awareness to that. And then from that place that I, I hope and pray that it will begin to change the mind of the average American evangelical, which has been so reflexively pro-Israel that they have ended up supporting so many things that have undermined the health and stability of this ancient Christian community in the Holy Land. You know, we were talking about these ancient Christian communities in Africa. Well, the Christianity started in the Holy Land <laughs> and Palestinian Christians are often just like baffled and kind of hurt and even offended when a Western Christian would come up and say to them, when did you convert? Oh, how did you become Christian? <laughs> they're like, um, like we, for 2000 like, years, my family has been a Christian, <laughs> you right. know? In the land of Jesus Christ, there have always been Christians, and we are descended from the generations of Christians who've been here through all of Christian history. And so, you know, just bringing more awareness of that to the West, I hope and pray, can begin to change the mind of the average American evangelical to think in a more nuanced way and in a more um, hopeful way towards peace, towards reconciliation, towards justice towards equality, towards making the wrong things right, rather than this sort of unthinking, de facto, I support Israel, and not even going beyond there. There is, you know, we don't live 2,000 years ago. We live today. The world is a different place than it was 2,000 years ago. There's a lot of history that has happened since then. And um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the, that's the main hope of this book. And I'm just so excited and thrilled and uh, to get it out there soon. Yeah, I'm anxious to I'm anxious to read it. There's so much of that um, as we all kind of 
have our own deconstruction stories to tell. I, I can just tell from talking to you, we haven't used the word, but that's, that's the, that's the process many of us, many of us have done where we've began to unravel our faith and take a look at it. And I love the way that you put it, Felicia, where you pretty much just said, I'll give it all the Holy Spirit and whatever's true will come back and Amen. everything else will just go someplace else. But so much of our knee jerk reactions to what's happening in the Middle East has so wrapped up in a particular brand of Western evangelical Christianity that says the end times happen, right? When all of that conflict really comes to a head. And so there are Americans I have found, shockingly enough, who are happy that all of this is happening because this is all a sign of the times. It means we're getting close to Jesus coming back. And and I wonder if either of you have something um, particularly pithy to say about that pile of silliness, but <laughs> I don't know. I just have teed you up. Go for it. Oh, do you want to go first, Felicia? I have a lot to say. Like, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're supporting an, an <laughs> ethology that that calls for like the death and destruction, basically, of all of these beautiful human beings made in God's image, Palestinian, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, for goodness sake, you know, that is, how is that the spirit uh, of Christ? Christians are being displaced from the Middle East. They are bleeding out, not just from Palestine, not just from Israel, but from all over the Middle East, from Iraq. You know, I've talked to refugees in my time over there, like living in Jordan, talking to these ancient Christian communities that are bleeding out and are scattered across the face of the earth as refugees now. And so much of it has is traced back to evangelical assumptions and expectations of the powerful uh, West, driven by Christian uh, eschatological ideas. And so I would just beg you to rethink those and to, to ask the Lord if maybe there isn't a, a different way here than, than dispensationalist eschatology. Right. Yeah. It just seems, it just, uh, it, it, anymore, it's, it's, I, it just gets a visceral reaction out of me. I just, yeah. it's so far out of my, you know, realm of, of thought process anymore that I hear those, I, I hear some of that jargon and I just get those triggers, you know, like, Ugh, oh, yeah, come on, man. Yeah. Uh, as a, as maybe like a final, uh, just conversation is I, I, Mercy, like you, you, you had that, that defining moment where things kind of opened your eyes. And for me, you know, sadly it took a little bit longer, I guess. Uh, for me, it was, Ahmaud Aubrey, it was George Floyd, it was um, those moments, right? And uh, it, tear, it, it brings tears to my eyes to even have to have these conversations still, right? And to come to the point where the pain, the exhaustion, the fear that the African American people and the and the Palestinians live in daily on. Uh, and so what, what it did for me is not only did it tell me that it was time for me to speak up and to say something, it told me that I, I didn't know their history. I didn't take, I have not taken the time. And unfortunately, our American academic world has not done a good job at all. In the last year or so, I've been reading and just shocked time and time again of stuff that I am reading that I had no clue about. I had no, I had no idea. The, the destruction of Black Wall Street was something, you know, not, not, I, I can't think of a single school that ever, has ever even talked about that. And so what that did for me is I said, okay, I got to stop. I got to stop reading stuff written by white people for white people. And I got to start reading books by African-Americans written by African-Americans. I need to start reading books about Palestinians written by Palestinians. I need to start reading books by indigenous people written by indigenous people. Um, I need to start reading books about the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community written by them, not by some white church guy who says, I, I think I understand their, where they're coming from. And what I would ask you know, from you guys is as middle-aged, white, heterosexual, I don't call myself a Christian anymore, but my brother calls himself a Christian. Where, where do we go? Where, where's a starting point to get to this history 
that we have been woefully unprepared to know that we have not been given access to by our whitewashed church, our whitewashed educational system. I mean, I'm not asking you to point to like specific authors, but I mean, is there like, are there organizations, are there places where uh, people like people like me can go to better educate myself so I, so I understand and can become, I, I posted this recently. Um, I, I am not, will, and I'm not, I didn't write this. I stole this from someone, but I, I, I no longer call myself an ally to the African-American community, to the LGBTQ community, to the Palestinian community. Uh, I haven't earned that title. At some point, maybe I will be called an ally, but I cannot give myself that title. But if there's any uh, if there's any chance of us becoming allies, how, how do how do we go about doing that? And I'll I'll just throw it out to both of you, and um, I honestly, whichever one of you wants to start. Yeah, I I absolutely applaud you. I I think um, just off the top of my head, one name that comes to mind is Dr. Christina Cleveland. Um, she used to be a professor in Duke's uh, Seminary um, Divinity School. And now she does a lot of work on her own. You can find her on Instagram, find her on Facebook. Um, she just, she's getting ready to do an, an e-course that's called Sacred Folks. And she teaches about um, the different stages and interviews that we go through as we uh, kind of move into the work of anti-racism. And, but one of the things that she talks about is the importance of um, looking for white people to deal with whiteness and really um, trying yeah. to find um, other white people that are on the journey of anti-racism that, you know, maybe a couple of steps ahead that have done some of this. And um, she named one in particular that I will, I will send to you. Uh, it is actually a book. Um, the author is Nancy. The last name is Flossberg, I think, but the name, the name of the book is Mattering and Marginality. And so I'll send you that. And then she has a few other things. Okay. Um, but that would be the places that probably are the most helpful because even, even sometimes, and I do agree with reading a wide range of um, authors and listening to other voices and things. I've done the same for myself. Um, just like you're saying, I think we have to look at the ways that even as a black person that I've been colonized. Right. And so that's, a lot of the things that um, I've been taught to believe or whatever are steeped in white supremacy. And so even in those ways, you have to un unlearn some things. But I also think there are some emotions and perspectives and things that I will never be able to explain to you because I am not a white person. I am not, you know, I don't fit that. And so another white person that has been on the journey of um, anti-racism work is going to be a great mentor. And I and I don't mean like Robin D'Angelo and white fragility. Okay. I mean, because there's a <laughs> there's a part to this, which is exactly what you're saying, right? About like, I'm not trying to name myself an ally. There's there's a part to it that has to be has to come from a sense of humility, from a place of willing to just be quiet, to just listen, to just learn, to sit with. And so a lot of times what you see is People will read one book and then they become the experts because honestly, white people are used <laughs> yeah. to being the experts. They are used to being the standard, which mm -hmm. everything is normalized. So, you know, so you have that. So you really, I, I think often of, um, you know, the white people that were a part of the freedom writers that were a part of SNCC that were right alongside of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis and, you know, and Dr. King was very honest about a lot of the work that he had to do. He could not do it alone. Um, Howard Thurman was the exact same way. He is my, my ancestral guide and my mentor, the person who I go to. I, um, Howard Thurman was the only black man rep that made the time 100 list of theologians in his day. He was the first person that founded a multi-ethnic church in San Francisco. And it wasn't just 
congregation. His leadership was also multi-ethnic. You know, so I go to voices that are looking for unity while holding particularity. Where are those? Where are those? And Good. so that's Good. some yeah. of what you're looking for. So I, I, I do read James Cone, yes, but I hold James Cone aside of Howard Thurman because when I read Thurman, I know that this was a man that was wholly captivated by love. And you see it throughout his life and how he lived it and how that's passed down. And so I, I think what you're looking for are voices that are not uh, still steeped in shame and guilt, which are fractions to empathy. Yeah. But they are they are out there and they're worth. And, but the thing is that they're not necessarily the ones with flashy Instagram pages. Right. Because they're not trying to. They have their head down just trying to do the work, you know, like a mercy. Aiken. <laughs> they, they have their head down <laughs> That's right. The work. right. They're just living right. it. And so um, but those are the those are the people and the voices alongside of what you're already doing that I would think. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amen. Felicia, so good. <laughs> yeah. All of that, right? Just one thing I want to say before Mercy, I want you to answer the same question, but before, before I, 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 I want to clarify one thing and that is coming from a white man and I'm speaking to white people, your one black friend isn't your, isn't your go-to for every damn question you have about how black people live. Right. <laughs> your, your one black friend is not the person who's going to school you and educate you on how yeah. to move forward within this racial uh, divide. That's your job. And that's one of the hardest things. That was one of the hardest things for me to come to, to come to understand is like, and, th and, th and this isn't just for your one black friend. This can be your one Palestinian friend. This could be your one Muslim friend. This could be your one gay friend. This could be any of that. They aren't your, they are not your library. They aren't your go-to. Do the damn work yourself. They're not your excuse to make you know stupid jokes either, and be like, right. "Well, no, 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 my I have a I have a black friend. It's okay." <laughs> it's, okay. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 I'm not racist. Uh, come on, man. Yeah. My neighbor's yeah. black, and I like him. He's a good yeah. dude. And I would say, inside of that too, one of the things that's really important is: Are you going where people are? Or are you expecting people to come to you? Right. So one of the things from yes, my yes, yes. interfaith relationship, I really wanted a Muslim friend. I really and so like I'm literally taking walks and I would do my walk, pray on my walks, and I was asking, like, I would love to have a Muslim friend. And one day I heard this thing so clearly, like, but are you going where Muslims are? Like, have you visited a mosque? Have you made yourself available? You know, and so are you open for relationship only in your head or are you actively putting yourself in proximity? How do you live? You know, where are you eating at? Where are you shopping at? Those things are, if you're just expecting the diversity to come to you for people to come to you, then that's a sign of privilege and it's a sign of supremacy. So we have to be honest about the ways in which we all play into that and, in, you know, in different aspects as well. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, I, man, I love it. I love it all. Mercy, you get the final word since John threw that question out to you. I'd, I'd be curious. What, where, where can we find the Palestinian voices? You know, the, the ones that we're talking about as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I'll just echo Felicia. Thank you so much for asking. You know, I'm not Palestinian. I just thank you on behalf of Palestinians <laughs> yeah. and uh, Israeli Jewish people who are working for peace. I don't want their voices to be forgotten either. They are also sometimes swept to the side. So I thank you on behalf of them. And, um, and just jumping off of what Felicia said, like kind of staggering the way that you read the books. I think there's such wisdom in that. Yesterday I was reading, um, C.S. Lewis, who was saying, for every modern book we read, we should temper that with reading some ancient old Christian manuscript so that we have like a deeper sense of our rootedness of the Christian faith and the perspective of the different centuries and millennium. And if for every modern book you read, read an old one, like just stagger it like that. Yeah. And, and I just say like taking that principle uh, is kind of what Felicia was saying, like stagger your reading even with someone who is like, just very aggressively speaking the truth. Like you need to hear that sometimes, even if there's a bitter edge, but then temper, don't only read that, temper that with someone who has been more 
seasoned and who has processed it a little bit longer in the journey. But I'll just, I just want to throw out some organizations that, first of all, because you didn't ask for books, you asked for organizations. Um, Christ at the Checkpoint is, was an organization started by Bethlehem Bible College. There's lots of great resources that are there um, that will lead you on a path where you can start hearing different Palestinian Christian voices. In particular, within that group, there's a, a theologian called Johanna Catanacho, who's just written some fabulous uh, Palestinian Christian books, Munther Isak. Uh, he just came out with a new book called uh, The Other Side of the Wall through IVP Press, and it talks about his experience growing up on the other side of the wall and the racism he experienced as a Palestinian Christian theologian. And it's very gracious. Uh, I think people will find it very gracious, one of those seasoned, gracious type of books that's also very truth-telling. Um, Reverend Alex Awad is another great one. He's Bashar's brother, and he wrote a book about their family. Um, Bethlehem Bible College itself, on the Israeli side, um, there are, there are several Israeli-run organizations that that help educate people about what's actually going on in the occupied territories, human rights abuses, things that the average Western person is not aware of, and until they're aware of these things, they're not going to understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because they're missing one whole huge side of the story. And I think it's helpful when you hear these things documented from Israelis themselves who are truth tellers within their own culture. So breaking the silence, these are people who were formerly in the army and they're talking about their experience. And what they did. There's another one called Bet Salem, which, which means in Hebrew, I think it like made in his image, the image of God talking about our common humanity, that we are all made in the image of God. They deal with human rights abuses. They're sort of like an Amnesty International type of group in that they, um, they carefully document these things. Rabbis for Human Rights is another great organization. On the um, Palestinian side, there's a great organization called al Haq which means the truth. And they also document all the human rights abuses from a Palestinian perspective. And Al-Haq is very well respected by the UN, the US State Department. It's like very thoroughly documented stuff. Like you can trust what you're reading from these uh, organizations. So that would be a little bit on how to educate yourself uh, from a Palestinian Christian perspective and also what's going on in the occupied territories. That is awesome comprehensive. I love it. Now you've put a whole lot of stuff on my plate and I appreciate that. So, uh, I, uh, man, it has been, um, every bit as awesome as I thought it would be. Um, so glad we were able to have both of you on. Um, man, it was just, a, I don't know, just a, just a neat, um, confluence of events that kind of put you both in the same spot. And I love that. Um, both of your perspectives are needed. Um, they're both very, very much unique. I love Felicia. I will walk away forever with this unity, but holding on to particularity yes. thing. I think you've really, I think you've really hit something there. Um, tying that in with the Trinity is a, I, I don't know, that's beautiful. There's a book in that, I believe. Um, you ought to be exploring that because we're, we're overdue for the book from you, but yeah, I'll be thinking about that one and chew on that for a little while. So as we, as we wrap this up, I'm just so thankful for your voices. I'm thankful for your willingness to come on and, and help us, um, to broaden our, our perspectives, to see, that um, that common humanity that, that you keep talking about and that I think is, is so key for us to move forward in any of this is that we have got to start to see each other better. We've got to start listening to each other, allowing each other to be who we are, embrace those particularities. I love it. And uh, so follow these ladies, follow Mercy, follow Felicia on 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 Facebook, Instagram, so far, no one's on TikTok, and I don't know what's going on with that, but whatever. One of y'all need to get, you know, get on the TikTok thing and start making us some new ocean spray videos. But, um, but buy the buy buy Felicia's book when 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 Mercy's book comes out, man. Buy several copies and give them to your friends. But um, at the very least, become more aware of what's actually going on, um, not just in America, but in in other parts of the world. So. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a great honor and a privilege. Uh, John and I both appreciate it very, very much. So we are signing off. Yep. This has been This Is Not Church, <laughs> although it has felt very much like church. So peace out. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash thisisnotchurch. 
where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.